And now, Rowan Radio 89.7 WGLS-FM proudly presents Your Health Matters. Your Health Matters is a weekly program that features interviews with local and national physicians about relevant health issues. This program is intended for general information purposes only. It is not a substitute for medical care. Please discuss this information and any questions with your family physician. And now, here's your host, Dr. Craig Wax. Welcome to Your Health Matters. I'm your host, local family physician, Dr. Craig Wax. Uh, We have a very interesting topic today, as always. Uh, We're talking about Canadian health care in crisis, gatekeeping for whom. And our special guest today is actually a family physician in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, Dr. Marilee Fullerton. Welcome, Dr. Fullerton. Thank you very much, Dr. Wax. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you. I appreciate you making time out of your busy schedule. Uh, Before we talk about the topic, let's talk a little bit about your background and training. What is your background and where did you train? Well, thank you. I'm a family physician in Ottawa, Canada, uh, province of Ontario, and that's been for about 30 years. Uh, I've seen a whole spectrum of different types of care, from palliative care to acute care to preventative care. So I, I run the whole gamut, and I've experienced the Canadian healthcare system specifically Ontario and Alberta, in a fairly detailed way. So I have a lot of background and a fairly deep understanding. I also study uh, complex uh, systems, and health would be part of a a complex system of health care. And I like to look into how the individual need and individualized care meshes with system need. Okay, so apparently there are two major philosophical thoughts, the Plato thought and the Hippocrates thought, and a lot of us were trained in the Hippocrates thought, that is, do your best every time for every patient, independent of all factors, whereas the Plato philosophical thought is more along the lines of, well, limited amount of resources have to make do for a large population so do the best you can for for the group with the limited amount of resources. Did I discuss that correctly? Yes, yes, you summed that up very well. And and we, physicians here in Canada, uh, different provinces are responsible for their own health care systems, and the federal government will provide some funding across across the board. But ultimately, it's about the provinces, those regions, defining what they need. And what's happened in the last probably last 20 years and more so in the last 10 years is a a real constraint on the ability of the provincial governments to fund all the care that's been in demand because as you know same things happening in the u.s as as canada our population is getting older Um, canada is aging quite a little quite fast a little faster than the u.s but we're still aging aging quickly so our system in canada was essentially designed Uh, for the 1960s with a young, well population with a fairly good tax base to support smaller numbers of people really needing a lot of care. And what's happened now is that switched around. So we have a lot more people needing a lot more care and fewer and fewer relatively um, compared to the the older folks um, supporting that. And so we, as Canadian physicians, you know, we understand the importance of providing really good health care across the board, but increasingly we are being asked to make value judgments um, and really preserve the system instead of preserving the patient. And there's tremendous discussion and controversy over, um, you know, futile care when we're providing care that may not help the patient in the end, depending on the circumstance. But it's a real conflict that we're going to be facing increasingly as to which patients are we going to spend the resources on and who are we not. Right. And so in a constrained system, that's the judgment that has to be made. Right. Well, we in the United States are are going through the early throes of what most would call Obamacare or the they call it the Affordable Care Act, but unfortunately it's it's an unaffordable piece of legislation that we've seen um employers dropping health care coverage across the board because it's just too expensive now that it has to cover every little nuance and and all of the states that decided 
to set up health exchanges to sell this insurance. And, and as you had said, they primarily are marketing toward young people. In fact, some of the ads that they're showing here in some of the Western states actually have college kids and kegs, um, alcohol, and, you know, uh, certain, let's just say, uh, very social activities. Let's uh, leave it at that, um, uh, because sex sells. And they're putting that in there in order to try and get all the young people to be able to get into the system to subsidize the older folks. And it was interesting that you had had mentioned that uh, in in the the, the foregoing. But uh, when we get back from the break, we're going to have to talk in detail about the Canadian problem and then potentially apply it to where we are in this country. You know, where are we going and why are we in this handbasket? So we'll be back with more of Your Health Matters right here on Rowan Radio 89.7 WGLS-FM. Welcome back to Your Health Matters. I'm your host, local family physician, Dr. Craig Wax, talking about a very timely topic, uh, Canadian health care in crisis, gatekeeping for whom, and uh, how it applies to us in the United States with Obamacare or the uh, um, uh, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, as it was uh, uh, unaptly named. Uh, our special guest today is Dr. Marilee Fullerton from her uh, office uh, up in Canada, Ottawa, Ontario, to be specific, and she's a family physician for 30 years. Welcome back, Dr. Fullerton. Thank you. Thanks for laying the groundwork for for this discussion, and certainly uh, I'm, I'm happy that the Internet actually enabled uh, this meeting and this uh, conversation because it's apparent that that the United States now has made certain decisions through laws and legislature that are sending us in a direction that of Canada, um, the UK, and other um, nations that have a socialized healthcare system that's either um, uh, prescribed by the government or exclusively run by the government and either way um, has a lot of uh, unintended consequences and uh, pitfalls. So can you tell us a little bit about in your early experience, uh, maybe in the 80s, perhaps, how all this came about, because I know that in the 90s, there was a huge exodus of physicians and um, even patients ever since to come to the United States um, and physicians to care for people here in a different system um, where people could pay for services, whereas uh, in Canada, they can't. So, you know, I'll give you a quick recap. Um, you know, we've had pretty much uh, socialized medicine here since the 1960s. Um, people thought this would be a good thing. Um, and by the 1970s, uh, early 70s, Canada had about the fourth highest number of physicians in the developed world. Um, and by the 1980s, uh, that number was, was still pretty good. But what happened in the 80s is the government decided that physicians would no longer be able to charge um, additional money to cover whatever expenses that they had in addition to the regular fee. And so they banned what they called extra billing. And so in those days, physicians could take the government-funded rate but could add a bit more, you know, $10 fee or $10 $15 fee to the patient to cover, you know, various other things. So in the 1980s, about 84, 86, the government stopped allowing that to happen. And they said, no, you will take this amount that the government will fund and that's all and so what happened after that is there was a lot of discontent doctors offices were having to be funded out of what the government was was paying them and so doctors started to be squeezed even back then and by the 1990s it was it was significantly worse in fact what happened in ontario was the government, provincial government said, you know, we're starting to have a problem funding um, the budget in general, so you doctors, you make a lot of money, so when you reach a certain amount of combined cost to the government, we're not going to pay you anymore. Wow. About a cap. So even though you had continued to work and you had three more months in the year to go, they said, we're not paying you anymore. That was called the cap. And then they, they also, as a group, doctors said, okay, well, you know, we'll work on reducing costs. And the government said, you bet you will, because if you don't, we're going to take money back from you that you've already earned. Wow. And so what the government started to do is even if people were on maternity leave or on disability leave, the government said, you 
you doctors, you're all going to pay us back a certain amount of money. So doctors started to leave then by the 1990s, doctors were set up. I have relatives who were doctors and left for the United States and never came back. Mm. Um, and so back in the 1990s, there was all this hard-handed um, dealing with doctors by the government, and physicians had enough. Some of them, and in the 1990s also, what happened is they, the, the decision makers, the consultants said, there's too many doctors. So as I said, back in the 1970s, we were the fourth highest uh, country with the, you know, compared to, for physicians numbers. By the 1990s, we were dropping off to about the 28, um, and government was rationing the number of uh, physician spots. So it said, we're going to cut back on physician enrollment. We're not going to have as many doctors. And then what happened was there was a doctor shortage. So the same doctors that had been clawed back and capped were now being told to work harder. And so the government said, you've got to get up these quotas. We've got our wait times are growing. People are waiting a year for hip surgery. You, you doctors, you've got to work harder because we need to get these um, numbers down. So they started to fund some doctors to work more and billions of dollars the federal government put in to try and reduce our wait time. Mm. And what happened then is the cost went up and then the, just recently the same doctors who worked very hard to, to reduce the wait times have now been blamed for causing the government to spend so much money. So in our system we are we are beaten around, and if we don't do something, um, then we're blamed. If we do do something, we're blamed. And who suffers? It's the patient. Right. Um, doc, you know, that's the, that's the ultimate goal that physicians work for, is the benefit of the patient. And what we're finding now is we're like little gerbils on a treadmill, running as fast as we can, and the patients still are not getting the care that they need, and the system is not able to fund it. But in Canada, in most in, uh, across the board, it's not allowed for people to pay for care. Right. So let me just explain that for everybody. So any procedure, office visit, uh, or any other service that a physician might provide directly for a patient uh, in a private setting or a free market um, is not allowed by law because the government system it takes responsibility for that, but then they force those people to wait until that service is available. That's that's correct, and and there is a difference at the federal level. We have something called the Canada Health Act that says if if um, provinces allow anyone to pay for care if it's a medically insured service, then they're going to take that money back from the provinces in an equivalent amount. Ontario is, even goes farther, saying that they make it illegal for a doctor to provide a service to a patient for a fee if that service is covered under the provincial insurance. And initially when this came out in 2004, doctors were, were being threatened with jail time. They, they lowered that and made it just a really, really heavy fine. Um, but but the, this idea that now that the government is unable to fund all these services that it promised there's still no other way to get it other than to leave the province or the country. And so we have created this environment where we've made every patient dependent on what the government can fund. And then the government hasn't funded it adequately. And there are about a million services waiting in the queue in Canada. So, you know, whether it's hip, a new hip or a new knee or whatever it is, there's about 900,000 patients attached to a service that they're waiting for. Wow. So, so what you're saying is is that the government um, promised everybody everything and then basically denigrated, demeaned, and drove doctors literally out of private practice business into working for the government and then now ran out of money to pay for those services. So... People can't get the services even if they want to pay privately for it. Correct. That's absolutely correct. And, and there's, there's people that are perfectly capable of paying, would like to pay. And, you know, there's all sorts of options that you could do for pooling, cooperative types of insurance. And yet the government won't allow that to happen. And so now we have 
We don't have death panels per se. I know that was brought out a number of years ago in the U.S. and there was a lot of claims of fear-mongering. So the, the, there's no death panel per se. But what we have is a system now that's being value-based and saying to elderly people, you know what, you need to make sure that your plans are in place, that you don't want this kind of care. You need to make this really clear to your loved ones. And that's fine if that's really what that patient wanted. And you're talking about advanced directives and not pursuing yeah, cancer yeah, care. and almost to the point now where people are being given the idea that they have the duty to die for the system. And so, you know, as, as I said, we don't have death panels, but we do have people that are in charge of evaluating what service should this person be able to get because the evidence shows it will only give them another six months or or only another three months. And on the basis of that, the government decides that you will or you will not be able to get that care or that treatment or that procedure. Wow. It's no longer between a physician and the patient to sit down with, you know, the family and discuss this. It's about someone else making that judgment who is in some other bureaucratic location. Wow. That's just amazing. And and what if, you know, somebody potentially could die without a certain surgical procedure, chemotherapy? Who do you appeal to? Is there any anybody in charge at all? I mean, that's the problem. Another problem is that it really leaves people who are extremely vulnerable and at their sickest to be the ones who have to find the energy to advocate for themselves. So if you go to the media with your story, if you've been declined care, then there's a good chance the Minister of Health will respond to you and maybe fund your care because it blows up in the media. Or you can make your case to a tribunal uh, or a a panel that will um, say, okay, you know what, we'll pay for you to go out of the country. But if you go out of the country first and then try and inc- and claim, you know, your 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 care back to the province, often those are denied. And so you have a situation where people are at their most vulnerable, trying to get the care, going through the hoops, trying to see who they can contact to make things happen. And increasingly, what we're seeing is be- is people being denied care. There was a young boy who was going to go blind. Um, and he was being denied a new treatment for his vision, three-year-old Liam. Wow. And and he was denied. There, it, 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 our, our province in Ontario and our country is littered with people who are being left to fight the government for the care they thought the government was going to provide. That's just incredible, uh, just incredible on, on so many levels. Um, we'll have to talk more about this Canadian health care crisis, gatekeeping for whom and how it applies to the United States uh, and Obamacare and the Affordable Care Act in just a few minutes right here on Rowan Radio 89.7 WGLS-FM. Welcome back to Your Health Matters. I'm your host, local family physician, Dr. Craig Wax, returning from the break talking about Canadian health care in crisis, gatekeeping for whom, and how it applies to our situation here in the United States with uh, the Affordable Care Act and Obamacare and all of the controversy. Our special guest, uh, who we have the privilege of uh, speaking with today, is Dr. Marilee Fullerton, who's a family physician in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, uh, for 30 years. Um, Thanks for coming back, Dr. Fullerton. I'm hoping I'm not giving the um, a really super negative commentary on Canada, but it has to be realistic. And I, I think that there's a lot of people in the U.S. that believe that Canada has this utopian healthcare system where it's all free, and and that just simply isn't true. The the average family of four um, would pay about twelve thousand dollars, eleven to twelve thousand dollars a year, um, into a tax system that is supposed to fund the care for them. And unfortunately, in Ontario, and especially my area here in Ottawa, mm-hmm. um, there's quite a few people that can't access a family physician. Um, in Canada-wide, there's about 5 million people with no family doctor. In Ontario, it's probably about 750 to 900,000 people wow. that we know of that are not able to get a family doctor. And that's not able to get because the family doctors are full. Yeah, and and the reality is when, again, when the government um, chose to cut back on medical school enrollment back in the 1990s, you know, we feel the the change a decade later when those family physicians aren't being produced. 
Now the government has done the other way and, and doubled some of the enrollment, and those doctors will be coming out very shortly. And what's hap- what will happen then is that the cost will rise as physicians practice and see patients and, and build a system. Right. And so, you know, it, it's, it becomes this it's a cycle. coaster. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's the patients that suffer. Um, government is is attempting to allow other providers, midwives, um, nurse practitioners, which you've had down in the U.S. for some time, um, and pharmacists giving flu shots and and being seen as a primary care uh, provider. Um, so what the government now is doing is almost opening it up to just about anybody, mm, yeah, um, with any kind of healthcare experience. Right. So basically, uh, Canadians are trying their hardest to be nationalistic and uh, dying for the cause. However, literally, that's what's happening. People can't get cancer care. They can't even get primary care physicians sometimes. And although some emergencies are handled appropriately, some things wait uh, months to years to get a, a specialty treatment or a surgery or chemotherapy, and unfortunately, life hangs in the balance. And then the government is scrambling to make their limited resources work for a population that's too large and quote too old uh, and too complex. You know, in terms of our healthcare needs, and uh, you've summed that up really well. Thank you. Um, yeah, you summed that up very very well. The the, the issues really are is that. Canadian and provincial health care in Canada has become so politicized that the government and is, is, is unable to tell the public that it can no longer fund it the way it has in the past and that, that the patient expectation has to change. And I'm a big believer in creating flexibility in systems like this so that things are a little bit looser, there's, there's room for movement, there's mo- room for, you know, event in one area to happen and not cause a shockwave everywhere. You know, if one area goes down, like everything else shouldn't also go down. And what's happening in Canada as they're talking about integrated care and coordinated care is everything is getting so tightly attached to each other that you can't have something happen in one area and not affect another, and, and we're seeing that now in emergencies. It's not unusual for emergency waits to be seven or eight hours or more. In one case, we had a patient die waiting. Wow, I'm sorry for care. And so, yeah, it, it is always the patients that suffer. And so, the government now is saying, okay, well, you know, we got to work on emergencies. But the emergency rooms are the canary in the coal mine. They represent what's happening in the rest of the system. But the government refuses to acknowledge that it can't fund and can't supply all the demand, the, the requirements, and, and because they're afraid they'll get voted out of office. Right. Well, we're in the beginning throes of all that here with a, a, a failed website launch for Obamacare as well as a, a, a failed uh, program that, that can't be funded for what it is now, let alone what it's going to be 30 years hence when we're sitting in, in your shoes, uh, unfortunately. So at some point, it needs to change and either... It needs to be a minimal safeguard that's reasonably priced and reasonably effective, or you have to allow private contracting with physicians and patients. And that's hugely important to what I call free market healthcare, health freedom, which allows people to get what they want and get what they need in in one way or another as per their value system. If somebody wants to get more information from you, um, do you have a website or Twitter account that people can follow? Yes. Yeah, so- Thanks for asking, uh, Dr. Wax. I'm at Merrily Fullerton. That's M-E-R-R-I-L-E-E, Fullerton.com. You can also reach me at Dr. D-O-C-T-O-R, Fullerton, um, and I'm on, that's on Twitter. Those probably be the two best ways to contact me. Um, and I think you've outlined it really well um, in terms of the risk that the U.S. system is embarking on. Um, to create expectations that can't possibly be met. And and I would caution um, anyone in the U.S. not to adopt the system we have here. We're trying to change the system we have here. 
Well, thank you again, Dr. Fullerton. Thanks for spending time with us, and, uh, and we hope we all can experience uh, health care, um, health freedom at some point real soon. Thank you, Dr. Wax. Take care. For this and more information, you can go to healthisnumber1.com. You can send us email at health at healthisnumber1.com. Uh, and also, you can follow uh, the show on Facebook uh, at Your Health Matters, also on Twitter at symbol dr. Craig, C-R-A-I-G-W-A-X, and uh, follow up that way. Well, that'll wrap it up for another edition of Your Health Matters here on Rowan Radio. We'll be back next week with another earth-shattering topic with another awesome guest right here on Rowan Radio, 89.7 WGLS-FM. You've been listening to Your Health Matters with your host, Dr. Craig Wax. This program is intended for general information purposes only. It is not a substitute for medical care. Please discuss this information and any questions with your family physician. Be sure to join us every Thursday at 5.30 p.m. for another edition of Your Health Matters on Rowan Radio 89.7 WGLS-FM.